Hello everybody, my name is Kara and today I'm here with my June wrap-up. The first book I finished in June was The Lost Colony by Owen Colfer. This is the fifth book in the Artemis Fowl series. This was a reread for me as part of our ongoing Artemis Fowl read-along. I will of course link our live show down below. I do think this book was really funny, like I think I had forgotten a lot of the really funny lines and dialogue in this book so I enjoyed that and I really really love number one as a character. I really didn't like the villain angle in this book. The ending frustrated me just as much as the first time I read it and I ended up giving this book 3.5 stars. Next I finished The 100 Nights of Hero by Isabel Greenberg. This is a retelling of the 1001 Nights story and it's a female-female romance between the main character and her handmaid or her primary lady-in-waiting and I really enjoyed this. I think the storytelling in this book was fantastic. Um, I really noticed how much I enjoyed the writing style which is not something I always pay attention to in like graphic novels as much. It sets out to tell a story about sexism and rape culture and that's what it does and it doesn't shy away from that. I really enjoyed the way the stories were interconnected um, as with the original 1001 Nights story. The only things I didn't love about this book I was a little thrown off by the frame narrative and I also really didn't like the art style um, at all basically like this is kind of what it looks like and it's definitely a very strong narrative choice I just found it really unpleasant to look at I didn't like the drawing style didn't like the colors or anything about the palette really so I ended up giving the 100 nights of hero four stars next I finished shadow play by Joseph O'Connor and thank you again so much to my friend Matthew for sending this arc to me so this is a historical fiction book um, that tells the story of Bram Stoker and of course we know him as the author of Dracula but this is actually based on the real events like the true fact that at his time he was actually most well known for being the manager of the Lyceum theater in England and we mainly follow him but there are two other kind of main uh, players, main characters as well, Ellen Terry and Henry Irving, both of whom were incredibly well-known and talented actors. Um, they were basically like the first kind of respectable and also celebrity actors. It's one of those stories that deliberately follows the least exciting character. Henry Irving and Ellen Terry were both so larger than life and all of their scenes were so incredibly well done and were so interesting that I really wished we had followed them more like I wish they had been the main characters, especially like there's some relationships we learned about with them that I found so fascinating and they that we never got that explained at all and also I feel like this book didn't really know what genre it wanted to be like there were some things about like a potential ghost story but then like it wasn't really addressed and I think this book is probably considered literary fiction but it's basically historical fiction and I guess the author just didn't want to write genre fiction um at least it's kind of what it sounds like to me I do think the writing was overall really solid except the author also had this annoying tendency to over describe everything it was almost like he was writing the draft and he came up with four really good options about how to describe a particular building and rather than choosing one or even two he just used all of them and it was just right after the other like he had this stylistic choice where he just used a lot of really long sentence fragments and that got really frustrating after a while also given the fact that Oscar Wilde is mentioned in I think the synopsis of this book there was not enough Oscar Wilde in this book he was in like one and a half scenes and also there's like this sort of homoerotic subtext in this book that I think was just abandoned the relationships that could have been queer if they were expanded on or at least like characters that were questioning their sexuality or their interest in people that never really happened like it just was dropped completely even though we had kind of all this groundwork laid so I ended up giving this book three stars but all that being said I am still glad I read it and that's something that doesn't always happen with three star books for me there were a couple of scenes in particular near the very end of this book that were just so beautiful like I think the ending of this novel was really 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 strong and there's one one or two scenes in particular I'm going to be thinking about for a long time um and again like some of the some of the glimpses we got of certain characters or certain scenes and relationships were just stunning and I wish we could have had more of that next I finished Zodiac Star Force volume one by the power of Astra by Kevin Panetta and Paulina Ganacho and I really enjoyed this um this is a superhero story about these girls who get their power from the animals or the signs of the zodiac um, and the main story of this volume is basically related to a villain that they already defeated possibly coming back and trying to bring other people over to their side my favorite thing about this graphic novel was the art i just adore the colors everybody says how beautiful this art is but they're absolutely right there's a female female romance that is just adorable in this book a lot of this volume is about what you do when the leader of a group is out of commission or is unable to help you and I thought that was really interesting. Um, the plot itself I thought was a little bit weak, ended up giving it four stars. Next I finished Torn by Natalia Jaster and I received a free arc in exchange for an honest review. This is the second book in a series, I don't actually remember the name of the companion series, um, but it follows like different personifications of 
emotions. Um, like the first one was was about the goddess love and falling in love with a human boy. And then this one was about anger and Mary and their relationship. I think these books are considered new adult. And I have really enjoyed Natalia Jaster's books overall. Um, this one I felt felt a little bit flat for me personally. I do think this book did a lot of things really well though. Um, for one thing, it avoided some of my least favorite romantic tropes. Like there wasn't really a miscommunication plot line, which was really refreshing to see. Um, and there also, there was a deliberate avoidance of the whole like, I'm not going to tell you the truth about something because I'm protecting you kind of thing. I also thought the friendships in this book were really, really strong. And I also really enjoyed the themes um, that this book continues on from the first book of free will versus fate. And like, if you have these deities that are causing emotions in people, in humans. Like, it's really interesting to see that from the perspective of these deities or these personifications themselves. I feel like the main characters, Mary and Anger, were kind of one-dimensional. Um, they really just personified the traits that they're named after and that was it. And while that makes sense that they are very much influenced by that that trait that they represent. Um, in the first book, I did get a feeling for love. Like, she definitely had a character outside of being the personification of love. So I don't know why that didn't really come through in this book as much. And then the main romantic relationship, which is between Mary and Anger, I... I didn't really love it. Any kind of strong relationship that the reader has to really believe in and invest themselves in, I don't like it when we are told about the development and not shown it. Like, there were a couple of times where we were told that Mary and Anger spent the whole day together and they talked on and on about things that were important to them and their favorite things and their least favorite things. And like, that was all the detail we got. We didn't actually see this conversation. We didn't um, see what she, what secrets they shared with each other all the time. I do think Natalia Jaster is an incredibly talented author, but I don't think this book is a good place to start with hers, especially because it is a companion book. I'm really, really looking forward to the next book in this series, which is going to be about Wonder. She was one of my favorite side characters and she's also plus size, which is nice to see in a romance, especially. Next, I finished Teen Trailblazers, 30 Fear girls who changed the world before they were 20 by Jennifer Calvert, illustrated by Vesna Asanovic. So the positives first, um, I really, really enjoyed the art style of this collection. Like, I like the color palette and the stylistic like, nature of it. I also really like the variety of women that they included, um, from modern day to ancient times and women from all walks of life, different races and ethnicities and sexualities. Like, we have Sybil Ludington, but we also have Jazz Jennings and Frida Kahlo, and I just really like the variety in this collection. I also really like the fact that for every woman they talk about, they included, um, a quotation from her specifically, and I really like that. That's a surprisingly rare thing. And there just truly were some really inspiring women in this book, um, a lot of them that I had heard of and read about before, but a few of them that I hadn't, and I really think that for that reason this book could be really important but I did have some major issues with the way that certain things were handled or described so one of my big problems with this book was the way that it kind of sugarcoated certain aspects that they were addressing like the way that this book talked about slavery it felt like it was trying so hard not to upset the kids reading it that it made it seem not nearly as bad as it was and that was really uncomfortable you know kids are smart enough and mature enough to understand things like that we start learning about the civil war from a pretty young age so if you're talking about that in a book that is geared towards kids i think you can be honest about it like maybe don't show like graphic depictions of some of the worst things that happen to people but call it what it is and then another problem is i didn't like the way that the author sort of framed things or extrapolated information on things like relationships of people that we have no way of knowing. So a big example of this, um, when they're talking about Pocahontas, she's described as falling in love with John Rolfe and marrying him. And I had a big issue with that because while we do have a lot of John Rolfe's letters that seem to suggest that he cared about Pocahontas, he was in love with her, that it doesn't follow that she loved him or that their marriage was consensual. And I really didn't like the way that was kind of implied by the way that that was phrased. This is another example of kids being mature enough to handle things like that. And the thing is, it didn't even have to be an issue. Like, if they wanted to talk about Pocahontas and the fact that she married John Rolfe, just don't say she fell in love with him. Just say that she ended up married to him and she went to England. And yeah, you probably should mention the fact that it'd be hard to imagine her being really happy so far from her from her home and the fact that she probably didn't get a huge choice in this marriage. It would be best if you did mention that. But if you're not going to, at least don't mislead the kids, you know? I ended up giving it kind of a middle-of-the-road three stars because, again, there were things I absolutely loved about it that I think were really well handled and really well explained. And there were things that I really hated and that felt very um, disingenuous to me. And I think this is a book that could definitely be useful and informative, but kind of use it with caution, especially if you're using it in a teaching context or are considering gifting it to a child or reading it aloud to your kids. Just be prepared to have some conversations with them because I think these books can be great conversation starters, but 
I just, I just wish this one hadn't approached certain things the way that it did. Next, I finished Banished by Betsy Shaw. This is the third and final book in the Storymakers series, and this was actually my favorite of the series. The first book follows a character named Dorothea, who is sort of loosely based on Dorothy from The Wizard of Oz, and she accidentally makes a wish that threatens her entire world of story. Basically, we're seeing a lot of consequences for the end of the second book, um, and we're bringing in even more stories and like fairy tales and classics. Like, Betsy Shaw really just threw in everything in the kitchen sink, and I kind of liked that. We're also following two major storylines, in this book and I really consistently enjoyed both of them. One of them is mainly centered around one of the characters trying to rejoin the group and I tend to find those really boring. I think it's hard to keep those interesting because it's like please just meet up with the other main characters so we can get to the main plot of the book. This book was also a lot less confusing than the second one. I remember reading that one and almost DNFing it at the halfway point but the end of that one blew me away and convinced me to pick up this third one and I'm so glad I did because like I said this was my favorite of the series. The only thing I felt mixed about with this book and the reason that I hesitate to recommend this series overall to somebody is because the balance of the dark story and kind of the cutesy framing of it like you get these little um these little quotations from like like the guide to being a storybook hero and things like that that I for the most part found really funny and really entertaining and that is kind of carried through like the rest of the books like there's like these parodies of like fairy tales like there are shoes that are called like Hans Christian Louboutins and things like that um and that can get a little bit overdone sometimes but for the most part I enjoyed it Everyone might not enjoy it, but I really liked this series and I gave this book four stars. Next, I finished The Seventh Bride by T. Kingfisher. This is a retelling of the Bluebeard story, so the one where he um, has killed like seven wives and then the main character ends up married to him too. And that's basically how this one starts out. There are quite a few points in this book where if I didn't know this was classified as a fantasy, I would almost call it a horror book because some of the descriptions are just so chilling and creepy, but in an enjoyable way. Like, I don't do well with creepy books in general, but this is the kind of like atmospheric horror that I can do, and I think it really added to the story. And I really loved the characters. Um, this is a pretty short book, but I still feel like I got a real feel for all of them and how they r related to each other, and I really got attached to them too. And I really loved the writing style. Like, T. Kingfisher has an amazing way of balancing humor and beautiful language and atmospheric kind of descriptions without going over the top on any of them. I also love how feminist this book was. Like the themes of women working together were just handled so well, I think. And speaking of feminism, um, there's this one line that I absolutely loved that I'm going to read to you. Um, it's describing Rhea, our main character's best friend, Susanna. She was short and plump and good-natured, and people assumed that she was a bit dim, which was a very foolish thing to assume. Like that's such a little thing, but that's right at the beginning of the book and I just I just loved it. Like I love the way that all of these women are equally important and they're not judged based on their appearance or like people's assumptions about them and it's just it's just wonderful. Like that sentence right there has better like character development than the entirety of Eleanor Oliphant is completely fine. Uh, where, you know, that book where it talks about how ordinary people are all stupid, but in like a harmless and charming kind of way. I just love this book. I loved the story and how everything came together at the end. Um, I love the weird, like the weird magic elements of this book too. The only reason I gave The Seventh Bride 4.5 stars instead of 5 is because there was one supporting character that I think didn't get nearly as much development or depth as the other ones did. Other than that, this book was fantastic, and T. Kingfisher is definitely on my favorite author's list. Next, I finished Aisha at last, but it was Magella Ludin. This is a Pride and Prejudice retelling that is set in Canada, and it follows a whole cast of characters who are all Muslim. And our main character, Aisha, sort of unknowingly gets herself involved with her cousin's uh, fiance, or who her family hopes for her to marry. And his name is Khalid, and of course, when she first meets him, she thinks he's really uh, uptight, really judgmental of her for not being like the right kind of Muslim and everything, and things kind of go from there. Um, of course, they both learn more about each other and how there's more to them than meets the eye, and I really, really enjoyed this book. Um, I think Usman Jalaluddin did an amazing job of incorporating the Pride and Prejudice story with her own twist on it. Like, I didn't feel... I didn't feel like this book went too far in either direction. You know, it didn't just rehash the story, but it also didn't depart from it so much that I didn't understand why this was billed as a Pride and Prejudice retelling. I love the characters, too. Um, not only is it just wonderful to see a, like, primarily Muslim cast, but just how funny and how complex they all were. I loved their family relationships and how complicated those could be. I love Aisha's relationship with her grandparents especially, and the chemistry between Aisha and Khalid was really, really good, and that's obviously very important when you have characters based on Lizzie Bennet and Mr. Darcy, um, so I just think that aspect was handled really well as well. Like, there were a couple of scenes with them in particular where like nothing ostensibly romantic was even happening, but like the tension was so good. And I also love the way that the author um, really handled the complexity of arranged marriages in um, in Aisha's culture. I thought that was so interesting and so 
even-handed. Um, like she draws a clear line between forced marriage and arranged marriages. You know, some some people who ask their family to help set them up with somebody that they want to marry. And I think that complexity was just really thoughtful and something that I don't feel like I've read a lot. The only cons I really had with this book um, is that the writing took me a little bit to get into, but after that I really enjoyed it. And there was this one storyline that revolved around Islamophobia, um, specifically in the workplace, and I don't feel like the resolution of that was entirely satisfactory, um, so that did kind of bother me. But other than that, I think this book is really fantastic, just a great retelling, and I ended up giving Aisha at last four stars. Next I finished It's True, It's True, It's True. It was semi-like devised theater, but the writing was apparently by Ellis Stephens and Billy Barrett. And this is a play based on the life of Artemisia Gentilici, who you guys may remember. Um, she was the subject of my favorite book of last year, Bloodwater Paint by Joy McCullough, and she, like, this play is based around the transcripts of her trial, of the trial where she brought her rapist to court, um, and that's what this play is devised from. The majority of the text is taken directly from that uh, that transcript. And I think this was a really powerful play overall. Um, I love the fact that all of the characters are played by women. I think sometimes when we see a play or a piece of art that talks about violence against women, when we have to see men inflict that on women in order to talk about it. I think there's this element of voyeurism that can sometimes happen. I'm not saying like we shouldn't go see plays that actually have men play those roles, but I think that there is something to be said for for the way that having women in all of the roles, including that of her rapist, I think that makes the space feel slightly safer. And it's not to say that women can't be rapists because they absolutely can, but I think that the choice to change the gender of the person who did this to her, I think that is a distancing mechanism that actually worked really, really well for this play. And I also think that some of the staging uh, choices for this play were also well done. Um, I ended up giving this 4.5 stars because I think some of the, like there's a lot of music cues and like they list what songs they were going to use. And of course this might be different if you're actually seeing the play performed, but just the way I felt about them, I think some of them were maybe unnecessary or a little bit too on the nose for me. And I also didn't like the fact that there were one or two things about Artemisia's character that they seemed to they seemed to frame in a way that suited their perspective more than hers. Like I don't think they were intentionally changing the story or anything, but I think that without realizing it, they had their own biases about how to portray something. Next I finished Blanca y Roja by Anna Marie McLemore, and this is a fairy tale retelling of the Snow White and Rose Red story, I think, but with kind of a Swan Lake twist. And we follow the two sisters of the title, and in their family, um, every generation there are two girls born, and one of them is cursed to become a swan. This book is really about um, how they try and put off the curse as long as possible, and then how they try and face it. Um, and along the way there are a lot of themes and storylines about familial love and romantic love and love between friends. I don't even know where to start with this book because I adored it so much. I love the writing as I have with all of McLemore's books. I absolutely loved the setting of this one and how like autumnal it kind of felt. Um, we were in kind of the middle of a heat wave where I live while I was reading this and just the cool like crisp kind of atmosphere of this one was just something I loved. But I feel like this book it's like the atmosphere is so varied and so beautifully described that I feel like it could be an atmospheric book for pretty much any season you wanted to read it in. And I absolutely adored all of the characters, especially Roja and Yearling, which I did not expect because going into this book I kind of assumed I would like Blanca and Paige best because I really tend to like those characters where they seem a little cool and distant and you really need to work to get to know them. I tend to really like those, but I ended up loving Roja and Yearling so much. And as with all of Michael Moore's books, her, her cast of characters is incredibly diverse. I will actually link a Twitter post that she did down below where she outlines exactly the representation in all of her books, but in this one specifically, um, multiple characters are queer and then Paige actually uses alternating pronouns. This book just handled so many things so beautifully and with so much compassion and depth. Like this book is basically like love plus fairy tale curse plus queer identity plus racism and colorism and really addressing those plus a beautiful writing and setting and character relationships splashed with a little bit of economic justice. Like this book just was amazing. I think I love it even more than Wild Beauty which is amazing to me. Like I didn't think that could happen. And can you tell I gave it five stars? Next I finished Ogre Enchanted by Gail Carson Levine and this is a prequel to Ella Enchanted and our main character Evie is turned into an ogre by the troublemaking fairy Lucinda um, when she refuses her best friend's marriage proposal. We mainly follow her efforts to break the curse or attempt to live with the curse and we also follow some of her adventures along the way as she meets other characters and she spends time with a band of ogres. I really liked getting to see the world um, of this one, like really seeing Evie go to different parts of the kingdom that we hadn't 
hadn't really seen before. Um, I loved the healer aspects of this book as well. So Evie is a healer and that's what she wants to do um, professionally. And it was really, really interesting seeing how that affected her personality and her worldview and how she interacted with other characters. She was so businesslike about this whole romance thing and that was really refreshing. Like, because this book in a way is very like romance centric in that she has to get somebody else to fall in love with her in order to break the curse but the way she approaches it is like so logical and non-romantic however i did have some issues with this book um i liked the romance more than i thought i would but but there's some things about it that i think i still would have preferred if they were executed a little differently and also the fact that it's a prequel is i think tricky because there were some cameos from characters that we know from ella enchanted and while i enjoyed some of those it's difficult because if you know what happens to a character later, then even if you enjoy seeing them and even if they're happy, in the back of your head you're kind of thinking about where they end up and sometimes that's a good thing and sometimes that's a bad thing. And I also feel like the tone of this book was a little bit confusing because there are some really terrible things and I feel like the characters didn't really react to that. And then the ogres themselves, while it was really interesting seeing more about their species and how they fit into this world, like I just didn't enjoy spending the amount of time with them that we did. Like I think we, I could have done with like less time spent with the ogres overall, even though Evie is an ogre, so that's kind of an unfair thing to suggest. And I ended up giving Ogre Enchanted 3.5 stars. Next I finished The Penel Penelopead by Margaret Atwood. I still don't know how to say this. So this is a retelling of the Odyssey from Penelope's perspective, and especially how that relates to the hanging of the Twelve Maids in the Odyssey. First off, the writing was brilliant, which to me was not a surprise because, you know, Margaret Atwood. <laughs> I also really liked the characterization of Penelope, um, and the fact that she actually had a personality, <laughs> which was nice. Another thing I loved about this book was the structure. So this is a pretty short novel, and um, the sections of Penelope's story, they're interspersed with, um, with chants or songs or poems from the chorus of 12 hanged maids or they will become the 12 hanged maids and i really really liked that um at first i was kind of thrown off by it a little bit but especially as the book went on we got some really really powerful poems or songs and like they were told in different styles and the the maids themselves act as a greek chorus so there's also this callback to the original greek myth that i thought was just so interesting it's obviously extremely feminist and i love the way that it centered the women in the story especially the maids who don't even get names um in the original story like they're just completely written off as being unimportant and that actually brings me to my one criticism of this book is which is that i wish the maids had had a little more differentiation among them like i wish they had had distinct voices or at least a couple of them would have felt more like real characters because even though it makes sense for the way that they function as a chorus i think it would have been really interesting and it would have fit in with the the purpose of this book you know to really humanize them and to tell their story if we felt like they actually felt like individual people. But other than that, this is a fantastic book and I gave it 4.5 stars. Next, I finished Puddin' by Julie Murphy. This is the companion sequel to Dumplin'. We follow two characters that we met in the first book, Millie and Callie. And Millie was wonderful and I adored her in the first book. She was one of my favorite things about that book. And then Callie was not. Um, she was not really a nice person. We weren't really supposed to like her very much. And so it was really interesting seeing her journey in this book. Millie really wants to get into a like journalism camp. Every year she has gone to fat camp, um, that the same one that her mother went to when she was younger that really like changed her life, she thinks. And so that's what she really wants for Millie. And Millie has gone along with it every year. But now she's decided that she's done trying to change herself. You know, she loves herself and she wants to accept herself. She wants to be a news anchor. So she decides that she's going to apply to this kind of journalism camp instead of going to fat camp. And then Callie gets involved in something uh, illegal and she ends up having to do community service and her and Millie end up working at the same place. And this is like the definition of an unlikely friendship. And I loved it. Um, I really, really loved seeing these girls get to know each other and get to like each other and respect each other. Callie definitely has a long way to go. Um, there were multiple points of this book where you just want to, you just want to yell at her and shake her, but it's always called out on the page, like explicitly by other characters, and Callie also herself realizes that what she does is wrong. So I feel like her character development feels very earned. Like it's not easy for her, and I liked that. We see Callie's journey in a way that doesn't excuse the way that she was before, but a way that still gives us hope that people can change. The romance in this book was also super cute. It didn't take over the story though. Um, relationships of all kinds really got equal footing in this book. Callie herself is actually biracial, and there is a lot of talk about how 
that has affected her in the town where she lives. Um, I do want to mention that one of the reasons I picked this book up during Pride Month is because I knew there was an asexual character and I had assumed that it was going to be one of the two main characters and it's actually not. It's a side character. So while that is still really nice to see, I just want you guys to be aware going into that if you, like me, assumed it was one of the two protagonists. And I think that Julie Murphy has a real gift for writing enjoyable and believable dialogue. Um, there were so many funny lines in this book, but it still felt very natural. And once again, I will just say that I adore Millie with my whole heart and she deserves the world. Um, I ended up giving this book 4.5 stars. The only reason I didn't give it a full five stars is because there's a pretty significant plot point in this book about, um, about privacy and like secrets getting told to people they shouldn't be. And while I think like, I think the privacy angle is definitely important. I think the characters with the secrets got off too easily. I'm being very vague because of spoilers, but um, basically there were some people who it's like, yeah, you should have been told on. But you did something that hurt people or that affected people's lives very seriously and like you should you should have consequences for it. Next I finished Cartwheeling and Thunderstorms by Catherine Rundell. Um, this book was actually chosen for me by my friend Jocelyn as part of my booktube friends choose my TBR. I had really loved The Wolf Wilder by Catherine Rundell and I also liked Rooftoppers by this author so I was excited to read this one and I hated it. Um, so we follow our main character Wilhelmina or Will and she has grown up in Zimbabwe. She gets sent to a boarding school in England and she hates it. I'll start off with the like one and a half things that I liked about this book. I think overall the writing was pretty solid and I also feel like some aspects of the ending were good. So uh, first problem with this book is that the whole thing feels just like trauma porn essentially in that there was no reason for so many things in this book to happen except that we had to make Will as like pathetic and miserable as possible. Um, it was like Dickensian street urchin levels of misery here and like right from the beginning of the book like the entire 50 pages that opens this book and it's a short book it's only there so that Will can get to the boarding school in the most depressing way possible. But like her mother dies when she's little but she grows up in Zimbabwe and like she has all of these like friends and she's like running free with the animals and everything. Um, so she's very happy but then her father gets sick and dies um, but not before her other guardian marries just like horrible monster of a woman who is like the epitome of the evil stepmother. Like I mentioned in my Goodreads review that I have read classic fairy tales that had more nuanced villains than this book. Um, so that happens. And then it's just like from there on it's like every single terrible thing that can happen to Will happens to Will. Um, like she goes to this like all girls school and apparently all 100 of these girls are just like horrible little monsters and like all of the teachers are awful to her like except maybe one. And while I understand that like Yes, there are some school environments that are like that. I'm not saying that never happens, but the specific storytelling choice to make that happen in this book when Will has already gone through so many terrible things and has more terrible things to come, it just felt like piling it on for no reason. And then speaking of the all-girls school, um, this book has so much misogyny or like internalized misogyny in it. Like it's so sexist. So Will has grown up primarily with men and boys so I understand why she maybe isn't as comfortable around women but over and over we hear how useless women are, how stupid and frivolous they are, how they're not good for anything and it's like she hates being at these all-girls school because like if only she had a guy friend everything would be okay. And in fact things only start looking up for Will when she finally meets a friend who is a boy. Thank goodness now she has somebody who can actually help her and who is actually like a worthwhile human being and I just hated it so much. Like he was one of the only decent characters in that book. Um, there was I think there was maybe one woman, one, one or maybe two women in like this whole novel who were like decent people. Uh, everybody else who was like an actual human being and not a monster was a guy. And another thing I really didn't like that made me really uncomfortable is a lot of the writing about Will's childhood in Zimbabwe versus like when she's sent to England. It felt uncomfortably close to the like noble savage stereotypes and I think the author herself actually was, grew up in Zimbabwe so I don't know why she was relying so heavily on those stereotypes but it made me really uncomfortable um, and I really didn't like that. And then on top of the more like problematic elements I just think this book was completely unenjoyable. Uh, I've already mentioned like the unnecessary suffering for like no reason. Um, I also think that the plot itself was just really boring. Like I, I had no interest in Will's like running away from school subplot or like not even subplot like that was like the whole point of this book basically after all of her needless suffering. Like none of the characters were developed. Will herself had no personality. She was just like a bunch of like quirky lines about how like freaking whimsical she is and everything and how she's better than all other girls. And yeah I hated this book. I gave it 1.5 stars because again the writing was like pretty good but 
I do not recommend this. Next, I finished Don't Date Rosa Santos by Nina Moreno, and we follow our main character Rosa, and in her family there is a story that all of the women in her family are cursed by the sea, and she has seen that with her own family, um, so if they get too close to a boy, if they're like too romantically involved with him, especially if he's a boy with a boat, um, tragedy happens and they end up dead. She's getting ready to go to college and she also really wants to visit Cuba as part of a study abroad program um, because that's where her family is from. Her grandparents fled Cuba many years ago in order to bring their family to Florida and start a new life there. That's a source of uh, friction with her family because her grandmother doesn't want to go back. She doesn't want Rosa to go back. She just wants to not think about all of that pain and suffering. And then despite Rosa's best intentions of not getting involved with anyone, um, she starts to hit it off and have a romantic relationship with a boy named Alex and guess what? He has a boat. <laughs> and this book was just so beautiful and so emotional. Um, it was just such a beautiful balance of serious topics about family and homelands and like fleeing the country that you love um, versus like a really wonderful sweet romance. I feel like this book is a fantastic example of how world building still matters in contemporary settings. I felt like I could see this town so clearly um, and I loved it. Like, I would love to visit there. I feel like the side characters were incredibly well developed as well. Like, they all felt like they had their own stories and their own lives and their own personalities. Like, they didn't just exist to further Rosa's plotline. And Rosa herself was just the sweetest and bravest and just most wonderful. Oh, I just love her so much. I also did not anticipate how much I would love Alex, um, her love interest. Like, the first couple times we meet him, I was just unimpressed and I'm like, oh, you're gonna be one of those. And then he wasn't really, like, he was just, like, the sweetest, like, I just, I can't. I'm, I'm, like, struggling to describe this book. And also, don't let this adorable cover fool you. Um, this book gets really heavy, emotionally speaking, and I cried multiple times while reading it. And after finishing it, I think I pretty much sobbed for, like, 20 minutes, so you know it was good. <laughs> but, like, I just, I love this book so much, and I'm sorry this has been one of my most inarticulate reviews ever, I think, but I gave this five stars. Like, this is just such a beautiful story about family and grief and trauma and being displaced from your country and and about love and all its forms and I just I just adored everything about this basically. Next I finished I'd Rather Be Reading The Delights and Dilemmas of the Reading Life by Anne Bogle and this was a book my friend Giselle chose for me as part of our five star TBR exchange and this is a nonfiction book that I guess guess you could say it's like a collection of really 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 short essays or like pieces about being a reader. I just loved this book with every fiber of my book loving soul. It was just, it was so good. I've heard so many books described as a love letter to books or to readers and I feel like this is one of the ones where that really fits. There were just so many wonderful things about it that were so relatable and so like beautiful. Like it really, this book makes you realize how magical it is that we get to experience stories in this way. Um, it just made me so thankful for being a reader. It made me so grateful for the fact that my parents encouraged that. Like, this book was just so funny and so real. Like, I really feel like Anne Bogle, like, she gets it. She is a fellow book obsessor, <laughs> and I love that. Um, like, the whole time I was reading this book, I was, like, I felt so, like, understood as a person who is extremely invested in fictional stories, or in nonfiction, too. She talks about that as well. Where she's talking about the way that when she says she's a book lover, she doesn't just mean I'm a reader and it's an important part of who I am. She means, like, there are books that helped shape who I am as a person, how I see the world, how I interact with the world, and that just hit me so clearly because that, like, that's something I feel is, like, being a reader is so deeply a part of who I am that it's hard for me to separate which books affected me the most sometimes, um, and I love that. I don't know which is my favorite topic in this book because, honestly, I loved basically everything she had to say, um, but there's one part where she's talking about finding books just at the right moment that you need them and how that how that's a, that's a little bit of magic. She talks about the stress of somebody asking her the question, what's a great book you recommend? If you love books, if books are important to you, basically if you are on this platform and you're watching this video, I think you could get something out of this book. And I loved it. Another five stars. It was a pretty good reading month in a lot of ways. Next I finished And I Darken by Kirsten White. This is a gender swapped um, Vlad the Impaler retelling and our main character is Lada and our other main character is Radu. They are siblings and they get uh, they end up in the Ottoman Empire. The book is basically about Lada trying to get power and get back to her homeland of Wallachia. Um, I don't really know how to summarize this book because it kind of feels like not a lot of things actually happened. And I feel like the characters were really flat. Like Lada and Radu, who are basically carrying this book, I just didn't feel like I knew them very well at all. Like Lada wanted to get back to Wallachia and she liked to fight things and stab people and like that's it. She's very determined and she has like the single-minded focus but we never really got the feeling for why she wanted the things that she was determined to get. And Radu was kind of the same thing. Um, 
I think I feel like he had a little more character development than Lada did, and then the character of Mehmed, he had even less development than I think Radu and Lada did, which was a problem because he was like the most important person to both of them outside of each other, which is like arguably not true. But we're told about this powerful sibling relationship they have. But anyway, um, yeah, Mehmed, like I just never understood why either of these people liked him. Also, I just want to point out that once again we have a like an Eastern uh, Eastern European fantasy book that completely ignores all of the naming conventions. Like, so Lada is a girl, and her full name is Ladislav. And as soon as I was started reading this book, I was like, mm, pretty sure that's a guy's name? I don't know, I'm not an expert, maybe I'm wrong. And I look it up, and sure enough, no. Um, the author just didn't bother or didn't care uh, to duplicate that believably. So that was also frustrating. I ended up giving Endai Darken 2.5 stars because I do think some of the writing was pretty good, and like I said, Radu's arc was more interesting than the other characters. But other than that, I was pretty unimpressed. Next, I finished The Time Paradox by Owen Colfer. This is the sixth book in the Artemis Fowl series, and again, this was a reread for the Artemis Fowl read-along. Live show, once again, linked in the description. I really like the character development in this one, and you really see a ex an explicit like contrast between who Artemis was when he was younger and who he is at this point in the series, how much he has changed, and also how much he hasn't in some ways. And I also really liked the time travel. I think it's one of the things that bumped this book up so much for me, rating-wise, because Time travel is not something I enjoy reading about. So the fact that this, the majority of this book involves time travel and I was still so invested and so interested and I liked the way that it was handled and used, that was pretty amazing for me. I once again was not a huge fan of the villain plot. Um, I've just realized that that's not one of my favorite things about the series and in this book it was no different. And then there were also several like character things that happened in this one that I was okay with when I was younger and I'm definitely not okay reading now. Uh, that was one of the things we talked a lot about in that live show actually. But other than those things, I did enjoy this book overall and I gave it four stars. And finally, the last book I finished in June was Stepsister by Jennifer Donnelly. This is a retelling of Cinderella from one of the stepsisters' perspective. We opened the book with the stepsisters cutting off their toes and the heel of their foot in order to try and fit into the glass slippers. So definitely one of the more serious, I think, retellings. And I had a very interesting experience with this book. I loved the beginning. I really didn't like the middle and was not enjoying the book at that point. I loved some things about the ending and then the epilogue really frustrated me. <laughs> but the main setup for this book is that fate and chance have a bet, sort of, or a deal about Isabel, the main character, and whether or not she can change her life and change her fate. Um, because she is going to die horribly and Chance thinks that she can she can become a better person, she can save herself and uh, save everyone around her from this fate. Fate says that she can't. So the thing I really hated about the middle of this book um, is everything that can go wrong will go wrong. Like it got to the point where anytime something would seem to go right for Isabel and Chance, I wouldn't even care because I'm like, I know that Fate or one of her minions is going to overhear their plan and like put a stop to it. But like I said, I did really, really enjoy the ending. And there were a couple of scenes in this book actually, like in particular, that I really, really loved. Like there's one that I'm thinking of especially that's like a play about like all the amazing women from history and like telling their stories. And I also think the character growth in this book was amazing. Like Isabel's journey is really complex and really interesting to follow. And I love the themes in this book and the way the way it talks about how like, like beauty can be a trap for girls, like whether you have it or whether you don't, people define you by it. Um, and I think that was really, like really important and really interesting. It did get occasionally a little bit heavy handed at times, but I think that made sense for like the fairy tale feeling of the story. The other main thing I didn't like about this book um, was the reason for the conflict between fate and chance. So fate's reasoning is basically like we've always used these maps for humans' fate. They've never been able to change their path before, so why should we start now? And then Chance was saying, like, you should you should let them have free will. They should be able to do things. Like, humans can do amazing things. And fate was basically saying, like, you can't change human nature. Um, and her primary reason for opposing Chance is basically, like, like, we've always done it this way and you shouldn't try to change it now. I mean, there might have been an allusion to order or fairness, like, how do we decide who gets to change their destiny or their fate and who doesn't, but I don't think there was really that much focus on it. And that was not a good enough motivator. Like, I hated reading about her. I hated reading about her chapters, and she had quite a few of them actually in this book. Like, her and Chance are pretty prominent um, players in this book, and I just, I could not stand her. I would have liked it so much more if the conflict between fate and Chance were based on something else, like something more substantial, and something that would make fate a more, um, more sympathetic character, I guess. Like, if maybe Isabel's fate while it ended badly for her, maybe it would save the lives of like a hundred people or something. And so then you would have the conflict about 
well, how do you weigh a life against a life? I think that would have been much more interesting and it would have made me much more um, interested in reading Faith's chapters because as it was, I just felt myself pretty unconvinced by her reasoning and maybe that makes sense because, you know, she is the personification of Fate. She probably doesn't need a reason to fight against chance except, like, fate being being like what she lives by. So this might be like an unreasonable complaint, but just as a reader, I would have liked to dread her chapters less, I guess, is what it came down to. Um, but like I said, like very mixed experience with this book, but I did end up giving it four stars because all of the things I liked about it were so strong that I think it did actually make up for um, my issues with it in the middle. Okay, everybody, so those are all of the books I read in June. Thank you guys so much for watching. I will see you soon with another video, and I hope you love the next book you read. Bye!